Hi guys, we're gonna cover chapter two in this video, so model building and gain from trade. Okay. So again, just like before, anytime you have a question, send me an email um, and then try to avoid posting a message below the video because I don't check them. Okay, so uh, let's get started. Um chapter two. All right, here we go. Let's see. All right, so so what is economics? Right, so economics talk about this before is about the study of how um, society dealing with our limited resource, and then um, economics is a social science. And then to make a science, we um, just like any other studies, uh, we use scientific scientific method, um, try to explain uh, any economic phenomena. So you know, observing developing hypothesis. Uh, do a model to test theory, and then uh, and then design experiment to test how well the model works, uh, and then lastly uh, try to uh, revise or refute the theory based on the evidence. So um, this happens all the time. So um, pretty much every um, economist is working on this all the time. <laughs> so developing theories, um, do models, design experiments, uh, revise or refute the theory that's based on evidence. Um, and then if you guys really want to see how one actually works, um, let me um, let me recommend a movie for you. Okay, so there's a movie it's called Beautiful Mind um, by Russell Crowe. Um, so this uh, uh, talk about this um, not a while ago, but a very famous mathematician, uh, John Nash. How he developed his theory uh, of Nash equilibrium. Okay, so even though his he was he was a uh, he was a mathematician, but uh, his Nash equilibrium uh, was uh, was tested um, um, and used in many of the behavior studies economics. Okay, all right. Um, so there are two types of statement: um, positive and normative. So positive statement is based on what is, uh, it's based on facts and numbers that can, can be tested, can be validated. Uh, normative statement is, is is not based on facts; it's based on opinion. Uh, so it's talking about what these things uh, ought to be or should be. Uh, so let me give you an example, guys. Um, if I tell you uh, that I'm taller than uh, Yao Ming. Uh, now that can be tested because uh, we can actually measure to see how tall each person is, and then we can uh, we can know you know if this statement is, is true or false. So that statement uh, that I'm taller than Yao Ming that's a positive statement. It's probably false, but it's a positive statement. Um, a normative statement would be like um, I tell you uh, that I am more handsome than Yao Ming. Uh, all right, so that's a personal belief, personal opinion, right? So some people believe that I'm more handsome, and people believe uh, you know Yao is more handsome. So it all depends on different people's opinion. So that's normative. Now for our class, we're gonna try to stick with more positive statement. I'm gonna change this again. Uh, hold on, hold on. Uh, give me pointer. Give me pen. All right, so I'm gonna. <laughs> Come on. Um, let me try this again. Give me pen. Hopefully this works. What? All right, let me just change this one more time. Hopefully this will work. All right, here we go. Just uh, and that, that was a long, long delay. All right. Um, Let's continue. Um, so we're gonna skip this first part of it um, because it's just talking about what model is. Uh, you guys all learned this in a science class. So we're gonna go over this. Um, the, but this term uh, called citrus purpose. It's very important. I want you guys to keep in mind and uh, know what it means eh? because you're gonna hear this a lot in the later chapters. So citrus purpose means it's Latin. Uh, it means everything else equal. Um, now this is what it means. That means whenever you see a problem for this class. Um, I want you to think inside of the box. Do not think outside of the box. So only think about the, the information, the variables that's given to you. Um, do not think any outside variables. So assume everything else all equal, nothing else change. Only thing change is the information that's been given to you. So suppose I ask you um, if the price for ice cream goes uh, down tomorrow, would you buy more ice cream or less ice cream? All right, so, so in that case, don't think about, uh, oh, what about the weather for tomorrow? Oh, what if I don't like ice cream? Oh, what if I'm allergic to ice cream? Don't think like that, okay? Just assume everything else all equal, nothing change. Same temperature, uh, same allergic reaction to ice cream. Uh, just when the price for ice cream goes down, what would you do? Do you buy more, do you buy less? Okay, so holding everything else all constant. 
right, so let me skip this too, not important at all. Um, but this, um, so this will be a, a very simple model in economics. So uh, we're saying that wage, so W, wage, is a function of education, age, experiences, skill, uh, pleasant conditions, and then you know gender, female, male. So this will be measurable uh, variables. And then there are also other variables that's, that's not part of this equation over here. So we'll assume uh, citrus paribus, that everything else all equal, okay? Um, by the way, there are, um, this is called, this will be called labor economists, um, where they try to study um, early wage is a big, big um, area in their study, okay? So they study different factors, how they can affect each person's wage, okay? All right, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna skip this too, <laughs> not important. You won't see this on the test. All right, so this is important. So something called a production possibility frontier. Um, now it depends on different textbook you might have. Uh, some some book called this one production possibility frontier. Other book called this one production possibility curve. Uh, they all mean the same thing. So it just shows you a combination of um, good that can uh, the society can produce um, always this available resource and available technology. So uh, a key word in this definition here is this um, can. So PPF uh, stand for production possibility frontier. So PPF doesn't show you what the economy is actually producing. Uh, it actually shows you what the economy can produce. So what the economy um, um, potential is. Okay, so keep in mind that this shows potential, not the actual productions. Uh, given an available resource and available technologies. Now remember last class we talked about this scarcity condition, right? We don't have enough resource for everything. So, so because of scarce resource, um, that um, this will be, there will be a limit, <laughs> excuse for the language, uh, there will be a limit on how much we can produce. So what is our potential of productions, okay? So a couple of assumptions. Uh, so first, uh, we have fixed technology. So technology doesn't change. Um, our resource is fixed. So fixed number of labors, uh, fixed number of lumbers, coals, electricity, water, whatsoever. And then uh, for a society, can only produce two good. Um, so remember the trade-off we talked about in chapter one? That's the trade-off over here. So for this two good, uh, when you produce one, you must give up the other ones, okay? So um, it's an inverse relationship. So in our example here, we're gonna do pizza and wings. So that's the two we're gonna study, and there'll be a trade-off relationship in between, okay? So uh, let's suppose um, on the vertical axis, that's the quantity of pizza can produce. On the horizontal axis is the quantity of wings can produce. Uh, so right here, um, that's our maximum number of wings uh, over here that's our maximum number of pizza. And then anywhere on the lines, anywhere in between. Okay, so they just capture different combinations of how many wins and pizza can produce. So in this case, uh, we're gonna, so for, suppose we can produce a maximum uh, 100 wings, or I can produce maximum, I mean 100 pizza, or maximum 300 wings. Uh, and then you have point C and point D, those are just somewhere in between. Okay, so point D will be right in the middle. That means at point D, we're gonna produce 50 pizza and 150 wings, okay? So half and half. All right, so there are different points on the graph over here, uh, and I want you to pay close attention to them. Uh, now, let me ask you a question. So suppose, suppose this point E over here, let's say this is gonna be 75 pizza and then 180 wings. So for this economy, is it possible for the economy to produce that much? Um, the short answer is no, it's not possible because we don't have enough resource of it. Um, and then the reason why we know that's impossible because this point is laying outside of our PPF. And then for any point that's outside of the PPF, we call them impossible because we don't have enough resource to produce those points outside. Now for point F over here, is it possible to produce 40 pizza and then 70 wings? Well, it is possible, but there's a special name for it. So for point F, you see how it's inside of the line over here? So point F, we call this point inefficient. So it's possible, but it's inefficient. Because at point F, we're not using all the resource we have. 
So here's a remember, all sides called impossible because we don't have enough resource. Points inside is called inefficient because we're not using all the resource we have. Okay, so I guarantee you, you will see questions like this on your test. Okay, so give you different points and ask you which one is which. Okay, and then for the points on the line, so A, B, C, D, they're called efficient because we're using all the resource we have. So points outside called impossible, points inside called inefficient, and then points on the line called efficient. We're using everything we have. Okay. All right, so efficient, um, that will be on the PPF. All right, so we talked about this already. Uh, another um, special condition for PPF is that also it also shows you uh, what is the opportunity cost moving from one point to the next. Um, so let's go back a little bit. Uh, I can give you an example here. This is in the way. So let's suppose we go from point C to point D. And the question is, what is the opportunity cost to go from point C to point D? Now at point C and point D, we're going to compare to see how much do they gain and how much do they give up from the two points. So go from C to D, we're going to gain, we're going to gain, um, so at point C I have 90 wings, Point D is 150, so we gain 60 wings. That's not how you spell wing. <laughs> 16 wings, and we'll lose, we're gonna lose from 70 to 50, uh, we're gonna lose 20 pizza. Okay, so the opportunity cost is always what you give up. So we lose 20 pizza, and that is our opportunity cost, going from point C to point D, okay? All right, uh, let's continue. All right, so there's also something called a law of increasing opportunity cost. Uh, so that just means um, the opportunity of producing a good increases as the, produ as the society produces more of it. Uh, and then because of the law of increasing opportunity cost, that sometimes your PPF is not uh, straight line. Uh, PPF might be uh, like a bolded outward. So if you say bolded outward PPF, that's because the law of uh, increasing opportunity cost. Okay. Um, and then let me give you some examples, um, show you the numbers, why that is. So let's suppose I have two people, uh, person A and person B. So we hire these two people in our company, and all we do is uh, translations. So we can either translate uh, Chinese paper and translate Spanish paper. Now let's say person A is very good in Chinese, so we can do maybe 10 paper in Chinese and then two paper in Spanish, and then person B will be reversed. It's very good in Spanish, so 10 paper in Spanish and two paper in Chinese. Now, to see this law of increasing opportunity cost, we need to draw our PPF. So between those two people, at the maximum, they can produce 12 Chinese paper or 12 Spanish paper. So if you find those points on the PPF, uh, let's suppose this is Chinese, this is Spanish, uh, 12 over here, and then 12 over here. Or uh, if we have these two people choose between them, um, do whatever you're good at. Person A does only Chinese, person B does only Spanish, then we're gonna end up with 10 and 10. So 10 and 10, uh, they're somewhere close to here. That's 10 and 10. So I have three points now, point A, point B, point C. Connect all the dots. You see how the lines border outward? Okay, that's your law of increasing opportunity cost. Um, and then we can show by numbers too. So if we go from point A um, to point B, uh, our opportunity cost would give up two Chinese paper. However, if you go from point B to point C, we're gonna give up 10 Chinese paper, okay? And the reason why, because at point A, we produce no Spanish paper. So when you produce um, the first 10 Spanish paper, you'll only lose two Chinese paper. But you, if, if you go from point B to point C, you already have 10 Spanish paper. They want to produce two more of it, you must give up even more number of Chinese paper. So the more Spanish paper you produce, the even more Chinese paper you must give up. Okay, that's called the law of increasing opportunity cost. And that's why your PPF is border outward.
right? And you can you can see by the numbers over here. Um, as you move along this PPF, the more number of wings you produce, um, the even more number of um, pizza you must give up. You see how the ratio um, it was. What well, this is um, one hundred twenty to. Oh, let's do this. So you see how those numbers are. For every eighty wings, you have twenty pizza. That's the first level, and then become for every fifty wings, you have twenty pizza. And then for every 20 wins or 20 pizza, and then the last one, just the number is just crazy. Okay, right? so, so the more number of wins you produce, the even more number of pizza you must give up. Okay. Or vice versa, the more number of pizza you produce, the uh, the even more number of win you must give up. Either way, they work the same way. Okay. All right, so to show economic growth, um, there's a point we didn't talk about much in chapter one, but I want you guys to remember this point very importantly, is that to see how rich or poor a country is, we don't care about how much money they have because money is relative. Money is not important. Oh, I just feel so good when I said it. Let's say it one more time, okay? So money is not important, okay? The reason why money is important because money is just a number. Uh, anybody can just print more money. But to see how, how poor, how rich a country is, we care about how much good and service they can produce. Okay, so it's all about production here. The more good and service you can produce, uh, the more uh, wealthy this country is. But uh, if you don't produce much good and service, then the country is poor. Doesn't matter how much money you have, because money in that case will be meaningless. So for example, uh, if you look at which country had the most number of billionaires back in 2008. Now, what's a billionaire? I mean, a billionaire will be somebody who has at least a billion dollar, right? So in 2008, the country had the most number of billionaires was a country called Zimbabwe. Now, if you know where Zimbabwe is, it's a country in Central Africa. It's actually a very poor country. The reason why they had the most number of billionaires because in 2008, uh, their money was worthless. So for our currency, our smallest bill is $1. And then for Zimbabwe, their smallest bill back then was $1 billion. <laughs> so anybody who had any money was a billionaire, but it doesn't make you rich because when you go buy, let's say, um, bananas, it costs you $3 billion just to buy like a pound of banana, then you're not rich at all. So we don't care about how much money you have. We care about how much good and service you have. So if you can produce more good and service, that is called economic growth. Okay, so it's the process then able to uh, the, the society to produce more good and service. It's called economic growth. Uh, and I can show this by using PPF. So anytime if you're um, so anytime if your PPF um, is shifted forward, that's called economic growth. Or you you don't have a this entirely shift. You just have let's say a tilt. So two this way, just just one good is being produced more. That's still economic growth. Okay, so just the ability to, to increase your potential. So um, there are a couple um couple ways we can increase our PPF or showing this economic growth. Uh, first way is that we have new resource um to uh, or technology could be introduced to produce either um one good or both good. So if you if your resource can be used to produce um, more of both good, then PPF is shifted outward. So both of this good are produced more, okay, or the potential goes higher. But if it's only for one good, then your PPF is actually tilted a little bit. It looks like that, okay. But that also shows economic growth. Um. So so if you have more technologies, better resources. Those are all shift your PPF. Um, all right, so that, that will be a tube. So in this case, uh, let's suppose uh, that our restaurant business, we had a new oven to produce better pizza, more pizza. Uh, so that would affect our potential output of pizza. So your PPF is tilted outward, okay? Or let's suppose our company decide we want to hire one more worker so it can produce more both good then um, your PPF is shifted outward. Now, in either case, um, in either case, if you show an economic growth, then your economy can produce more good and you will produce more good, more of both good. Now, in this case is obvious because when you have more workers and produce more of both good, but in the previous case, we can also produce more of both good, 
if our PPF is tilted outward. So uh, let me show you why that is. So suppose before, before our uh, economic growth, we're producing at point A. At point A, we produce 70 pizzas and 200 wings. But if you have an economic growth, you can, you can actually produce at point B now. At point B, you have 80, um, 80 pizza and then 220 wings. So more is being produced for both good. And the reason why that is because if your production for pizza is getting better now, we can, at the same time, shifting more resource to produce wings. That's why both good can be produced more if just your pizza is getting better, okay? Let's get this. Uh, all right, so now the specialization. Uh, specialization is the limiting um, of one's work to a particular area. You guys learned this before in your history class. Um, remember um, Henry Ford and, Mar and Model T, that he made this uh, assembly line. So instead of having workers to focus on all production of the, of the car, we have the workers specializing just one part of the production of the car. That way they're more efficient and then they can produce more of the cars. Um, and the same thing happened to McDonald's. So in the old days, um, when you have an employee at the, at the restaurant, at a fast food restaurant, uh, this employee uh, is able to produce, all, do everything for the restaurant. But when McDonald's come in, uh, we train the employees um, specifically for only one thing, and then they become good at it, that we can produce more, uh, we can produce more of burgers and fries in the restaurant, giving fixed number of employees, okay? So um, for this specialization, uh, we're gonna assume again, uh, we produce only two good, um, and there are two people with different abilities. Um, so one person is good in pizza, and then one person is good in uh, wings. So here's our example over here. So let's suppose uh, for Deborah. Now remember, guys, these numbers here. This is not sixty wings, or uh, sixty pizza and one hundred twenty wings. This is sixty pizza or one hundred twenty wings. So this is a choice over here. Okay. So Deborah Winner um, can produce sixty pizza or one hundred twenty wings, and then Mike Piazza uh, can produce twenty four wings. A 24 pizza and then 72 wings. Um, and then there's this thing called an absolute advantage. So absolute advantage is the ability to produce the good more than the other person. So you can produce more of the good, then you have an absolute advantage. Now for, um, remember we did comparative advantage back in chapter one. So comparative advantage is the ability to produce the good and the lower opportunity cost. But absolute just means you can produce more of it. So to find to see who has the absolute advantage in pizza, we're just going to look at numbers. Um, so for pizza, um, Debra can do sixty, Mike can do twenty-four. Then Debra has the absolute advantage in the production for pizza. Now for wings, um, do the same thing again. See who can produce more of it. Debra can do one twenty, and then Mike is seventy-two. So Debra again can do a number, more number of wings. So that's the absolute advantage. Okay, so for absolute advantage, it's possible to have one parties with both absolute advantage. Okay, so let me say again, make sure you remember this. So for absolute advantage, it's possible to have one um, to have one party with both absolute advantage. Now, however, uh, for comparative advantage, it's always one party, one comparative advantage. Okay. All right, we're gonna show that later. <laughs> but just for now, remember, absolute advantage is one. It's possible to have one party with both absolute advantage. All right, um, let's draw the PPF. So what the, that's what the PPF looks like. Um, and then from this PPF, uh, let's suppose right now there is no specialization. Okay, so each party uh, will only do a half and half. Well, it's not even half and half. It's less than half and half. Okay, so for for the per, for two productions. Um, Debra, Debra will produce uh, 40 wings and 40 pizza. So that's Debra's production. Uh, let's call this D. And then Mike will produce 18 wings and 18 pizza. So if the two parties cannot trade with each other, they both must be self-sufficient. Now again, self-sufficient means you consume everything you can produce. So if that's the case, um, then 
that's the production and consumption for both parties, okay? So uh, that will produce and consume number wins, uh, number of pizzas, uh, and then my produce and consume number of wins, number of pizza. Now let's add up total to see how much we have. So between Deborah and Mike, uh, when they're operating with no trade, so each person is self-sufficient, then in total, we're going to have uh, 58 pizza and um, 58 wings. Okay. And then next, let's look at how specialization can help these two parties. Um, so let's suppose, let's suppose that Deborah will only produce uh, pizza, which means he can, she can produce 60 pizza, and then Mike only produce wings, and they can produce a maximum of 72 wings. So between two parties, we now have 60 pizza and then 72 wings. Now compared to before, it's 58, 58. Now we have 60 and 72. So by specializing, we can produce more of both good than if each person is just self-sufficient and then divide the resource equally. Okay, um, and the re reason why because it, uh, it's because that we have this difference in um, opportunity cost. So to do this type of problem, and you're gonna see this a lot, especially on your quiz, on your test, that I'll give you some numbers and I'll ask you to find out uh, what is the opportunity cost, uh, what is the comparative advantage. Okay, so let me show you how to do this. It's a it's an easy process. Oh, when I say easy, it's not that easy, but you gotta do it, okay. okay. Um, let me erase this. I need some room to work on. All right, so to, to find the opportunity cost um, to do the comparative advantage, um, I use a process uh, that I call uh, the four price method. So between two parties and then two good each, uh, you're going to have four prices. So we're going to have the price of um, wings for Deborah. The price of pizza for Deborah, um, the price of wings for Mike, and then price of pizza for Mike. Okay, so the price of each good for each party. Now, to do this um, opportunity cost or the prices, uh, this price is not in dollar term. This price is always in turn of the other good. So when we do the price for, for wings for Deborah, that will be in turn of pizza. And when we do the price for pizza, that'll be the that'll be in turn of wings. So how many wings do you give up to produce a pizza? So this will be a simple fraction. Um, we're gonna use numbers for Deborah to find out what's her opportunity cost. Um, and then this is how you do it. Remember this: whatever price you're looking for, that maximum production number goes on the bottom of the fraction. Okay, so simple fraction over here. So whatever price you're looking for that maximum production number goes on the bottom of the fraction. So in this case here, we're looking for the price of wings. And for Deborah, the maximum number of wings goes on. Oh, don't need this. So the maximum number of wings goes on the bottom. So Deborah can produce 120 wings. Um, and then pizza goes on top. So that will be 60 pizza. And then simplify, this will be one half pizza. Okay, and then we'll do the same thing for, for Deborah for pizza. Uh, so this would be um, pizza maximum goes on the bottom. So 60 pizza and then 120 wings goes on top. So that will be two wings. So for Deborah, when she produce one wing, it costs her half pizza. When she produce one pizza, it costs, you two, it costs her two wings. Uh, for Mike, same concept, but we're going to use different number for Mike. So maximum number of wings, this is set on 72 wings. Pizza on top is 24 pizza. Simplified, this is a one third pizza. And then for pizza from Mike, um, pizza on the bottom now, so 24. And then um, wings on top, 72. This will be three wings. Okay, so that's the opportunity cost. Now, once you have a four price method, uh, the next step is very simple. You just find out whoever have a lower opportunity cost, and that will be your comparative advantage. Okay, so. Uh, show me. I want a highlighter now. <laughs> show me a highlighter. All right. Um. So let's look at the price for, um, for wings first. So for wings. Okay. Um. Notice how Mike 
it will cost him one third pizza to produce a, a wing. For Deborah, it will cost her a half pizza to produce a wing. Uh, so one third, this is cheaper, right? It's cheaper than one half. So we say Deborah has the comparative. <laughs> this is supposed to be zero, yeah. um, but you guys know what I want. So this is supposed to be comparative advantage for wings for Mike. Now for pizza, uh, let's look at the numbers again. So for pizza, um, Mike can do uh, three wings for a pizza. Deborah can do two wings for pizza, right? So this is cheaper. So we say um, Deborah has the comparative advantage in the production for pizza. Okay, so whoever have a lower opportunity cost, that's a comparative advantage. And then the benefit of knowing the comparative advantage is that once you know the comparative advantage, you know that was that the what the party is good at, and therefore they can specialize in their production. So so Mike is good in wings, Deborah is good in pizza, and they should specialize in what they're good at. So Deborah only produce wings. I mean Deborah only produce pizza, and then Mike only produce wings, and that is how you end up um, with the numbers over here the 72 and then 60 pizza okay so that's the comparative advantage uh, which led to specialization which led to more output between both parties all right all right so once you have this more output between the between both parties and they're divided fairly um both parties can now consume a point that's outside of their perspective PPF. Now remember point C, we learned this before, point C is called impossible, right, or unattainable, because we don't have enough resource to produce a point C. But if you trade and you specialize, then you will be able to consume in point C. So point C is now becoming impossible. That's called the gains from trade. So trade will make what used to be impossible now at possible. That's why trade is good, okay? All right, um, let's continue. All right, so now what's the turn of trade? So turn of trade uh, is basically what is the price of trade? So when two party trade, what is the price that they will both accept? So this price is gonna be between your two opportunity cost. So for Deborah, um, for uh, if you look at the ratio between pizza and wings, so when Deborah produced one, um, I want to say one one pizza, or I'm sorry, one wing, it will cost her half pizza. Uh, and then for Mike produce one wing, cost her cost him one third pizza. So the term of trade, when they try to trade between both two parties, um, how much is wings uh, for the trade? Uh, it's going to be between these two numbers. So it will be less than half and then more than one third. So it must be in between. Now, if it's not in between them, we've got a problem. So let's suppose the, the price for trade uh, is gonna be for every wing, uh, the price for trade will be one pizza. Well, that's pretty good, right? So if I'm a if I'm a producer for wing, I can sell the wing for one pizza. Uh, then if you're Deborah, you want to sell, right? Because um, you can do it cheaper than what the price currently offered. Um, and then if you're Mike, you want to sell too. Because again, you can do it cheaper than what's currently be offered. But if both parties sell, nobody buys, then you don't have a trade. So for this trade to work at this price, it has to be in between these two parties over here. So once in between, um, Michael still sell, and then Deborah here, she will choose to buy wings. Okay, so that's called term of trade. So it's the price that's settled between two parties, and it has to be between the two parties. I mean, the same thing can be applied to dollar term. So Suppose you go to a flea market and you see somebody selling their OTV, um, so a very old TV. Now let's suppose uh, that you are willing to offer um, $100 for the TV, and then the seller is willing to accept, uh, let's say, uh, anything more than 70 then you're going to have a deal. Right, so um, because you can, you, you can offer more than what the seller is willing to accept, then that's good. But let's imagine the seller says, oh, no, this, this, this 100 is too low. I will accept nothing less than 120. Then we got a problem. 
because now you are not willing to pay for more than what the seller is, is asking for, right? So, so for this to work, um, how much you're willing to pay has to be less than um, how much, I'm sorry, has to be more than how much the, um, the, the seller is willing to sell. Okay, so it has to be, must be in between these two parties over here. By the way, uh, if you're gonna see a question like this on the on the quiz on the test, um, I will give you different numbers and ask you which one might be the possible turn of trade. Uh, what you're gonna realize is find out whichever of the choices are in between of the two opportunity cost. Okay. All right, let's continue. All right, so know the difference between short run and long run. Uh, so short run, um, you're gonna have immediate um, immediate payout. Uh, long run, just long run return, okay? Uh, in 2302, we're gonna go into more details about exactly what's a short run, what's a long run. But in this case here, um, the reason why we talk about short run and long run is that once you guys know the difference between consumer good and then capital good. So consumer good, um, they're used for current consumption. Uh, capital good is used to produce other valuable good. So it's like an investment. So investment into the future, okay? Um, so between every society, you have a choice. Uh, do I produce more consumer good or do I produce more capital good? Now the benefit of producing more capital good is they can produce more consumer good in the future. So, um, Let's suppose see there's a chart over here. We can visualize everything. So let's suppose this is the case here. So between two scenario, um, that for year one we can produce two pizza. Uh, for year two, that we're gonna shut down this oven over here and then make an improvement on it. So if you don't do any investment, you still produce two pizza. But if you're doing investment, you produce no pizza. But with investment, your future production will be higher. So you can produce three from that point on. Okay, so that's the benefit of investment. That's the benefit of, of investing more into capital good. That even though you have less consumption good in year two, but in the future time, you have more consumption good. And that's the benefit of investment. And then to illustrate on the PPF, um, so, uh, if you have, um, so let's suppose on the vertical axis is our capital good, on the horizontal axis the consumer good. So at point A, we having a lot of consumer good, but very few capital good. So next year, your PPF is only growing um, just just a little bit, right? just right here. Um, however, if if we put if we have less consumer good, but a lot more capital good, then next year PPF can shift or by a lot. That's the benefit of investment. And this goes with anything, even for you guys. You have a choice. Um, do I go to school or do I go to work? Uh, that if you go to school now, you make more money now, but uh, in the long term you won't because you don't have education. But um, if, you, if you delay work, uh, take some time off and go to school, then you can have more return in the future. That's a long-term investment. Okay, all right, so that's it for this chapter, chapter two. Um, have any question, let me know. Okay, so this is not a this this is not the easiest chapter in the book. Uh, there are a lot of difficult concepts. Okay, so take your time slowly. Uh, just have any questions, just ask me. Okay, all right, guys, uh, let's stop here. Uh, good luck, and then I'll see you for chapter three.